You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hey everyone, welcome back to Accounted For. Today is a little bit of a different episode, you may have noticed from the title, but I've been trying to kind of accumulate more questions I've been getting from people as I've been having more meetings and, you know, it's great to have fans reach out and I like connecting as well. But, you know, over time, some of the questions get quite repetitive and it's given me an idea of maybe having a few kind of AMA episodes so that I can guide people to these kind of sets of questions that I get asked often and you know we don't have to go through the whole dance of scheduling meetings and all that as well and so then when I do get questions from people then it'll be new and interesting makes it fun for me makes it fun for you because you know I still love interacting with my fans as well so this particular episode um, I've been getting a lot of podcasting related questions and there's so many other people that do talk about it but I think I guess a lot of the people people that talk about podcasting, it's people who are already very successful <laughs> at it. Um, and so it's different when someone who's just kind of only been doing it for about a year talks about it. And I guess it's a little more relatable too because, you know, it just seems like another Canadian guy, millennial, doing a podcast who's been in the corporate world is a little different. So I got together a bunch of questions about, 12 questions that I've been consistently asked over and over again from friends, from people that get introduced to me, people that reach out to learn more about podcasting. So this is an episode that hopes to answer those questions and yeah, hopefully it adds some kind of value to you and maybe it'll give you some guidance on how maybe how you can start your own podcast as well because you know, more the merrier. So here is the first question. The first question is, how much does the equipment cost? I, um, my memory, like so. Oh yeah, by the way, none of these are re- rehearsed answers. I just have all these questions that I compiled, but I'm gonna be thinking on of the answers on the spot as well. So, yeah, the equipment cost, it, it's under a thousand, but it's very close to it. It's about close to a thousand dollars for this mixer. Uh, this recorder slash mixer thing that I have and the wires, the mic, and yeah, the headsets, all that. I'd say all of it costs in total together under $1,000. I So I have two um, audio technica mics, two sets of XLR cables. Oh, funny story. I have technically three mics because I broke one of my mics. It just rolled off the table and it hit the floor and it just broke it shattered the insides apparently because it just ceased to work so i had to replace it so that put me back you know nice three digits there i think it's about a hundred something dollars per mic and yeah i have two two over-ear headsets that i use with the guests so that they can hear their own voices and that's something people don't realize until when we actually go to the interview and i give them their headset they go whoa i'm gonna hear myself speak and I go, yeah, yeah, you're going to hear your own voice. So that's always a fun experience. I think it makes it a better interview too because you can kind of gauge how you actually sound. So then I'll notice guests kind of switch up their tone and all that too. So second question, uh, how did I find the equipment and what to use? Yeah, so that's a, for anyone that wants to over-optimize things, it's always a, you know, it's a slippery slope. You don't want to go down too deeply into all these YouTube videos because there's so many out there. So what I did is I knew that I wanted to have in-person interviews. So then to do that, I needed a very mobile set. And I I just kind of had a bias against just using my laptop to do it. And so I thought about podcast guests who have similar setups. And I know Tim Ferriss moves around a lot. And he talks about how he has a mobile podcast setup. So he actually... I think he, it's, it's like a public um, link. He wrote a whole article on what he he uses and I literally copied the entire setup that he has. And yeah, that's basically it. 
I just went to Tim Ferriss's site, saw what he had, and I looked at it, looked at the price, and I thought, okay, seems pretty good. All right, a little more expensive than others. Like some people don't even buy this recorder thing, which costs more than fifty percent of the total budget, I'd say, and they just use whatever software that computers provide with like a USB mic. I have XLR mics, um, so it can be way cheaper. So a thousand, I'd say, is on the higher end of things. Actually, going going back to what I just said, and so yeah, I just went to Tim Ferriss' podcast and、um, picked the one that I, yeah, that I thought would be fitting to my taste. But I am thinking of kind of investing a little more because it's something I want to do more of, and I'm thinking of getting my、uh, what's those mic arms on for my recording table so that when I actually have guests come to my place. Which I want to have more of. It's an even more legitimate setup, and I also have ideas to do more podcasts. <laughs> so I always have ideas of other kind of podcasts I could do. So yeah, that's definitely something on the table for sure. And yeah, so then what is the next question? The third question I have here is, how do you host the podcast, and what analytics do you use, or do you do? So that's also been a development. So I used to use Squarespace as my podcast host. So there's generally pretty there are few big ones. There's Lipson, Podbean, Blueberry. Those are kind of the older ones. Simplecast and Anchor are the newer ones. I think that are a lot of the young,、uh, the younger podcasts are coming into.、Um, I use Squarespace just because that's where my website is also hosted, and you know I've met people who are. All for Squarespace. Some people who are just extremely against it, and I use it just because it was easier for me. It's always just been about how can I make this easy for me, as easy as possible for me, so that I can just continue doing it because that's the most important thing. It's not. I think I don't think it's as important that you do things right in the beginning because it just nothing will be right anyways.、Um, so yeah, I used Squarespace, and. I think when I ran Squarespace, I used a separate plugin with Blueberry. So Blue Blueberry, also they're a podcast host, but they also have a separate analytics service. And so I used their analytics link and embedded it into my Square Squarespace host. So if you're actually doing a podcast, you understand this is how very intuitive. It's very easy, and I'm not very good with technology either. And so I just constantly haggle,、uh, bothered the Squarespace. What do you that the customer support team for help and it was very easy and yeah that's that's basically it for the first part and then it it evolved into so what I use now is what is it called transistor so transistor is the new host I use the reason for that is because they why did I use them oh. They already have a pretty good analytics engine part of the host, so a lot of the other hosts have in-house analytics engine. Squarespace does too, but it's not very good. It's n- it doesn't tell you much at all, really. It just tells you the R- RSS subscriber number, which doesn't really help, and it's not even that accurate, I think. And Blueberry's free analytics was just okay. So Transistor, I think I pay something like nineteen USD per month. So. The reason for upgrading from a free version to a paid version was because I wanted one host that did analytics and hosting, and something else I wanted was to、um, what is that? Well, one particular thing was that it gave me flexibility to host more podcasts because Transistor has a no limit thing. So since I have ideas for other podcasts, it gave me that flexibility. And another thing also was that. Transistor can submit, I guess, episodes into Shopify. So some hosts are limited in what they're connected to in terms of the actual、um, audio audio platforms. So there's iTunes, Google Play, and Shopify. Those I'm、um, not Shopify. Spotify. Sorry, Spotify. Spotify and Stitcher. Those those four out there are the big ones that most people really listen to, and Squarespace. Didn't have access to Spotify, and so I felt I was missing out on a lot of listeners there because a lot of my friends use Spotify, and they also said they use that for their podcast listening as well. So I figured, all right, that might be worth the nineteen dollars, and also better analytics and more optionality for the future. 
So that's why I decided to do move the host there. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. It's a pretty great host. It makes everything really easy for me as well. And they also do an auto upload into YouTube as well. So I don't know how much listeners I get from YouTube. I don't think a lot at all, really. But it's a nice option to have to really automatically have that. And let's see the next question. What software and tools do you use? So in terms of tools um, and software, I really only use one. I'm trying to think. I think I only use one software. Uh, I use Audacity. And I so I used to have a PC. And right now uh, I have a Mac. And I use I used Audacity for both PC and Mac. Uh, I've heard you can do pretty good audio edits on GarageBand, but because I learned how to do audio edits on Audacity, that's just what I use. I use the free version, and it's great. It does everything I need to, and it doesn't take long to learn it either. I'd say the learning curve in the first, like the first few episodes, you know, you spend about twenty minutes watching a YouTube video, and then you're pretty good to go, really. I'd say the only tricky thing was related to making the intro, like the sound fade in and fade out. That's just a lot of trial and error, really. But yeah, I'm constantly learning things as I go as well, like changing pitches for the anonymous podcast. I have to learn that separately and it's really easy stuff and quite an intuitive software. And I'm trying to think. there I don't think there's any other tool that I use other than my equipment and that singular software and then the host. Yeah. What marketing do you do for your podcast? Yeah, a lot of people ask this question a lot too. And everyone's so obsessed about growth, 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 growth. Come on, Dan, how, where are you going to hit a million dollars in podcast money, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I say I tell people I don't do any of that. Um, I really don't do much marketing. I... I do my, so I'd say most of it's organic, purely like I really rely on my guests to share the podcast episode with their network. And that's how I, a lot of the listeners come to, come in. Um, and some of the listeners I've actually had a chance to speak with, they heard about it from their friends. And oh, I also did try experimenting with some form of social media marketing where I had a period when... I was posting stuff on Quora and Reddit. That was actually pretty valuable, I would say. And it's, some, it's a strategy I'll consider in the future because Quora is just so specific. And it's, it just seems to be that's where like my audience is because it's a career podcast. And so people ask career questions on Reddit or Quora. And Reddit, I'm not allowed to really advertise things. So people come just based on, they read answers that I give to set questions. And then I think because my, the... What's it? The username is the same as the site name. They end up finding it that way, I think. Or either I'll try to kind of sneak in that, oh, from this podcast, da 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 da, you know, this question has been answered. But Quora, definitely people come from that where someone has a specific question about, oh, what does a product manager do or like a growth marketer do? And I say, oh, well, here's a high level and here's the podcast that I interviewed for this person in Canada. Boom. And that brings in uh, more listeners. And then I do just the regular sharing on my own LinkedIn and my Facebook. And that's about it. I don't do anything on social media Social media in terms of Twitter or Instagram. I just equate social media to Instagram and Twitter because I just feel that's where most people are. And those are the ones I just don't use at all. And yeah, like some people have asked, oh, why don't you market on just Instagram? You're missing out on so many eyes. But a part of me also thinks one part uh, for the argument is, yeah, but are they the eyes that I want? And some people think you shouldn't be picky about your listeners, but I think you should. Like, I'm not doing this with constantly looking at the analytics side, going, oh, are people paying attention or not? I rarely check my analytics because at the end of the day, I just, I really don't want to care if people are listening to it or not because I think that's not going to help me in staying motivated. I'll actually have listeners write in directly and those are super helpful i think those are the most motivating when you've been able to break uh influence the listener enough so that they break down this barrier this kind of artificial barrier and they actually reach out through the site and 
you know, go through the contact page, send me a note saying, oh, thanks for the podcast. And you know, they ask me questions. And yeah, I think that's awesome. And I think that 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 re- those are the times that it really motivates me. Like when I read a new review on iTunes and I go, oh, that's awesome. And that's, that's when it gets me. It The download number, it doesn't really excite me um, too much. It's, it's more of a stressor because it's always, you know, the mind's, one mind says like, oh, wow, wow, this is amazing. But most of the times it's always, God, I got to do more. I got to do more. Like, you know, I'm, I want to hit a higher number. And I think it sometimes can get a little toxic because, yeah, like it's it's not why I started it, really. It's not, I didn't do it so that I would be like Joe Rogan or something. You know, yeah, sure. Would it be nice? Yeah, that'd be great. But, you know, that's, we're going to wait and see after if I can do this for about 10 years, right? If I can't even do it for 10 years, then I don't think I really, I I earned myself there at all. So, yeah, that's definitely um, my stance on analytics. So, yeah, I really don't look at it. And, oh, and sorry, the original question was marketing. Yeah, I'm just rambling off here. <laughs> but, yeah, um, yeah, on marketing, that's definitely my stance. Not much, not much marketing. And don't really see the need for it although one thing i've been considering in terms of reframing has been not to think of it as marketing because i personally have a negative view of marketing this is and i'm not saying people who do marketing are bad it's just i have that negative stigma for it where it seems like it's commonly used to manipulate interaction but the way i'll get around it i think is to try to find people that i can add value to so if I can add value to more people's lives by sharing the podcast, then yeah, I think that's a different kind of motivator for me, at least. Next question. Why did you start the podcast? You see, when I get this question, I know the person doesn't listen to my podcast <laughs> because it's such a dumb question to ask me sometimes when if you took a little look into the podcast if you listen to at least one episode or if you just read my podcast page it should kind of tell you why i started it and so now I, I hope when i guide people to just listen to this episode first they will just listen to this and they'll know why i started so i don't want to go too long about it i think it's very obvious um because i do talk about it separately and uh, i think an episode my Christmas special episode that I did last year. You know what? Screw it. I'll I'll just do the long story. Why not? I'll do it after I take this sip of water. See, I rarely talk so long on a podcast, and I I always don't. Re- I forget how dehydrating it makes me. Like at least my throat it makes me really appreciate the effort my guests actually go through to constantly tell me their like tell me what their stories like on and on and like 20 minute intervals sometimes and gotta appreciate that yeah it's amazing okay so back to the question why did you start the podcast i started the podcast because i had wanted to do a podcast for a very long time so actually i might have not written about it so i can't blame people for not knowing <laughs> quick thinking dan um so I want so I've been listening to pod, listening to podcasts since twenty honestly twenty fourteen twenty thirteen probably twenty fourteen um so I've been listening to them for a while and it, it it always was a thought right when whenever you like something you consider oh could I do that too and it just seemed so you know it just seemed like a lot of work in the beginning and I didn't really know what I would do a podcast in and. After I left more, uh, my job as an investor, I that's when it kind of hit me of okay, well, you know, I'm going to take this period as a sabbatical and let's just do a bunch of projects to test out a bunch of hypotheses I have about what I want to do next on this next journey in my life. And a particular hypothesis I wanted to delve into deeper was this idea of interviewing people because when i was at the fund i had a lot of fun interviewing ceos that that i think was the most fun i had um it wasn't even finding stocks as much as just getting the chance to talk to people and just 
drilling into what their companies are and just also even learning about the person. So I had, I had a lot of fun with that. So I thought, okay, well, I love having these long hourly conversations. Let's, how can I test that? And I also only tend to listen to long form podcasts, like typical Tim Ferriss style, where it's hour, three hour podcast. And I thought, okay, well, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll do a podcast. And so when I came back to Toronto from, so I used to work out in Calgary. That's where the fund was. So when I came back to Toronto, a lot of my friends started reaching out and they started asking questions of, Hey Dan, uh, you know, I, I want to be an investor. I want to be a management consultant. So uh, most of the time it was my accounting friends who would ask me about what it was like in my time in consulting and investing and tell me about how they want to transition in or it'd be consulting friends who were asking advice for going to be in, you know, trying to be an investor. And I was already doing a lot of coffee meetings. Um, after I got back from Toronto, I was curious about the tech space. So I met, um, but I think in the early early time period, I met easily about 20, 30 different people in tech, like product managers, data scientists, venture capitalists. And I was already grilling them on what they did to get a better sense of that world. So then friends would also start asking about that, how my conversations have been going. And a lot of them had all these assumptions that were completely wrong. All these dreams from watching TV shows like House of Lies, Rick Sultans, Wolf of Wall Street for investing. And yeah, they, you know, stuff they read on the news that just completely exaggerate things. And so I was spending most of my time just shutting down ideas, shutting down all these ideas that people had. And. I thought, wow, well, you know, it's, it's taking, taking me a lot of time to meet with all these friends one on one while I'm doing all my own meet on my own meetings. And I thought, is there a better way to scale this? And that's where the idea of doing a podcast where I record the conversations I'm having with these people came up where I thought, wow, maybe I can use this to get even more interesting people. And it's kind of a win-win. They get to come on a podcast and share their story because who doesn't love talking about themselves? I know I do. And so that would also give me a way to then share their insights with my friends because my friends were always curious. So that's that's kind of a, the early period of how it all kind of started, I'd say. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I think... I'd say that was mainly it. It was the fact that a lot of people don't really seem to take the time to, um, yeah, they don't really seem to take the time to look into what people actually do and they just try to apply to jobs or apply with these far-fetched ideas and they try to stay within all this conventional realm of things. And so that's what um, I decided to dig into and showcase and share with the podcast so that's how I, I got started doing it and that's been just shy of a year and a half ago I started in I think August or September so we're in close to December now as I record this um, the end of November so yeah it's been a while and actually this links up pretty nice to my next question what's kept you going for the last year Yeah, I, it's um, I mean, one one thing is that the conversations are always fun, and it's definitely been a work in progress for sure. To I, I'd say yeah, to a lot of things. One one particularly is finding the right guests. You know, it's some people say they want to do it but they never end up scheduling time like it's it's very common it's not like i have a hundred percent hit rate right you're gonna have rejections from people but i still want to have people that i would be interested in having fun talking to with and so that's always been a thing where usually i'd say most of the time like 99 percent of the times i get a guest and i'm always curious and i think because i'm naturally just curious about what everyone in the world really does like it really helps with that so that's definitely been a very important factor in just 
constantly motivating me to do it because yeah like if the conversations were not fun it'd be hard to keep it going right because i'm not doing this for anyone else but really for me like that's why i started it and i think that's something i've learned over time and something i've learned while um, paying attention to people i'm inspired by like other i'd say media creators out there like you know other really famous podcasters that i constantly listen to or like other famous writers they all say the same thing all these creatives they always talk about the fact that although their current um product you know book podcast whatever is listened by millions and serves a lot you know a global audience when they started it and some for most of them still to to this day as they do it they do it for themselves it's not for other people and that's what keeps them going and so i think that's something i've been constantly trying to be cognizant of like not to let the external world interfere with what i want to do and yeah not trying to do things that other people want me to do either so that's definitely definitely um a big factor there and yeah like yeah to be honest it there are times when like it's not like every moment is fun right there there are times when it's really frustrating it's really frustrating when you know when the scheduling just goes fucking out of whack and it yeah it just sucks sometimes where and you and you go like oh god why is it so hard like why can't people just schedule times and when they say or like why why is it getting rescheduled for months and months why are people not replying when they said they would do the podcast like there's all these things that definitely bother me and it just makes the process yeah like just a little annoying um and so those are times when you go oh god this is annoying <laughs> um and yeah there's also times when it's just a busy day or i have other priorities like other parts of the platform I'm trying to run trying to build my own brand trying to find opportunities to do more of the work i want to do and sometimes yeah like i know that i have a promise to keep i i'm on, i'm on a schedule on a weekly podcast episode and so yeah sometimes it it stresses me out thinking oh god how, how am i going to find a guest for this week how what episode am i going to do and getting creative about things so those are times yeah those times are always there and yeah like i and then I think back to you know what it's not that hard just you'll find a way just make it happen and it's not the end of the world if i miss a week i tell myself that constantly i haven't missed a week yet but that's what i tell myself where i'm doing this for fun so i want to make sure that it's fun and one thing that is a nice wonderful giant cherry on top is the fact that i have you guys writing it and what's awesome is yeah my fans who write in and tell me about how much um how much the podcast has helped them in their lives how great it is to just tune in every week and how valuable the information is yeah i'd i'd say yeah that's definitely the kind of stuff that keeps me motivated it makes me think more about it and it makes me want to do better interviews and improve as an interviewer myself and yeah that's that definitely keeps me going um that's kept me going for the last year and it's definitely going to be a big factor in keeping me going for the next year as well and i'm also constantly trying to figure out how can i make it more fun more fun more fun right i want to make it so that i can try to get as close to having every day related to the podcast as fun as i i can make it and that requires a lot of um system uh alteration as well like i had trouble in the beginning figuring out like the right balance of oh like when do i how should i get guests to come on the podcast how should i ask them how how early should i be asking people um do i want to do all these constantly in person because it's become difficult sometimes to get some guests on because i can't meet meet them in person so those are things i'm constantly debating and considering but yeah um that's definitely a work in progress as well i don't know like i think the big question right now is do i do remote interviews will i do online uh skype based interviews i really don't like um 
I I don't mind Skype calls. Like I do a lot of them, but and I have done a lot. Like most of my CEO interviews when I was at Moore was Skype calls. But when I do this particular podcast, I feel like I have to go deeper into the individual and I want to build some kind of human connection. So I've been very adamant about doing it in person. And some of the feedback I get is that people say, oh, yeah, like I can tell there's a there's a big difference in quality and the kind of conversation you guys are having and also the audio quality as well. And so I definitely know it means something. But if it can mean I can get cooler more wide variety of guests that's something i'll definitely consider as well and the next question is how do you get your guests <laughs> oh good segue it's like i didn't even plan these kinds of questions um how do i get my guests i linkedin stalk people <laughs> that's that's basically it i so i have this giant excel sheet where i just constantly just throw names in and I, I just constantly throw names in of people that I just come across on LinkedIn that I think are interesting and then I'll try to go through the the name the name list and try to see like hmm would this person actually be interesting um, are they nearby for me to do the in-person interview and yeah like that's that's generally how I reach out like I just go on LinkedIn and sometimes I'll just see people who just get referenced in some weird way from my existing network and that's how I'll come across guests. Sometimes I'll actually have, I'll ask my current podcast guests to recommend people in their own network that they think are super interesting that could be good on the podcast. And so that's actually how I find some some other guests as well. And that's also been a pretty cool way of meeting new people. Um, there's nothing like a nice warm intro to get guests. Um, but yeah, I'd say a lot of it really is also just my own curiosity like i see a clothing brand and i'll go oh that's pretty cool i wonder who runs that oh it's a canadian company huh i wonder if the ceo is based in toronto or vancouver and i'll be like oh wow this clothing company is based in vancouver i'm gonna put them on my list for when i go back home and try to get in touch with the ceo there so that's how i'll come up with stuff um yeah when i see it's definitely easier for companies that have stores or actual tangible goods that i can see um, but sometimes it's even software. If I see it, I'll go, oh, well, that's pretty interesting. Or sometimes I'll hear on some other kind of indie podcasts where other Canadians are going on. Then I'll try to um, see if those people are interesting. Some of my podcast guests go on other podcasts. And so those podcasters might have interesting guests. So I'll dig through there. So there's all that stuff out there that kind of becomes this giant web or this net that I use to cast out and find guests. And I try to also be cognizant of themes where sometimes I feel like, oh, I spoke to so many entrepreneurs, maybe I'll find some other people, um, like that kind of stuff. So I try to be cognizant of the occupation, maybe, of the individual. But yeah, that's generally it. Let's see. <sighs> Next question is... What would you do differently if you had to start it all over again? Oh, yeah, this was a tough question. I got to ask this question a few times. And I don't remember what I said. But I just remember it was probably not a very great answer. <laughs> um, Try to think. What would you do differently if you had to start it all over again? Yeah, that's... um. Hmm. I don't know. I guess if I... Oh, oh, yeah, that's one big thing. I think I would set up a kind of information guide for all my podcast listeners, kind of like a like a mini listener, uh, a mini interviewee contract thing, just so I don't have to go through the headache of those times, early uh, times when I record a full interview and then the guest just... Like after full edit, guest was aware the podcast is going out and they go, oh yeah, I don't want it out anymore. I think it's going to damage my career. And I go, what, what are you talking about? We like we agree like this and although the podcast is technically my property, property of um, my holding company, it's also like, you know, I just don't want to ruin that relationship either, right? I don't want to make the person feel uncomfortable and all that. So it's it sucks. It sucks when that 
kind of stuff happens, then that definitely stressed me out and caused me some heartache. So I would love to um, not go through that again. So I think I'd set out those boundaries cl- like clearly out ahead of time. And I think having that kind of stuff would have been quite helpful. Um, what else? What's another big learning? What would you do differently? I don't know. I've had fun. And I, there's not many that I would consider that I made as mistakes. I guess because it's, you know, some people might take the point of view that, oh, but you're, you've done it for a year and, you know, you're, you're, you're not... You're not like one of the top successful people out there. I'm like, yeah, you know, you're right. I'm not. But then again, it's I told myself I wouldn't get so hung up on that and I'd focus on having fun. Oh, that's what I'd do. Yeah. I would have fun more. I would not get stressed about it. I would stop listening to what other people tell me to do. I think that's a big one. Because like I I can go more into this later. Um and I think there's another question that's similar to it, but I'll touch on it briefly right now. It's it's like when you have a podcast and when you tell people about, oh, typical Toronto question, when you meet someone, to, well, oh, what do you do? And I tell them, oh, I have a podcast. And I'll tell them about all the stuff that I do. And one of them is like, yeah, I, I, run, I produce a podcast. Or you know, all the university friends, high school friends that you haven't seen in a while, but they are aware of what you're doing catch up with them and they're like oh yeah like so you have a podcast and then they give you so much unsolicited advice it's insane it's and i and i joke about it and i write about it um about how when people give you unsolicited advice it's just uh you could see it as in one perspective just them trying to be nice but it could i think at a deeper level it's an unconscious bias of an insecurity where it could just be a reflection of your need to feel useful about something. And, you know, I don't mean any malice in that, but, you know, sometimes I think that's just where it comes out of on a just purely uh, emotional basis. But, yeah, like, you, I'd stop listening to a lot of those, like, all these people that are like, oh, you should monetize, you should find advertisers, or, you know, oh, you should make it a video you should go on youtube because look how successful joe rogan is because he has a video i think you get way more listeners or you should make your podcast shorter because it's too long you lose my attention or oh you should cut stuff up into little bite-sized bits and um market it on instagram and it's all like they there's all these this it's a lot of garbage really i think at the end of the day it's just a lot of garbage that you listen to and it's something I've had to learn where the truth is, yeah, like most advice you hear is shit because none of them are from podcasters. N- no no other podcaster I've met tells me what to do. They don't give you advice on, oh, you should do this because we all know the kind of journey we're on. We all know that this it's a really tough thing to do really well in and be successful in. And none of us are doing it to become auto millionaires. Right, it's always people who've never done anything. They're they're just spectators in the arena, that are just trying to give you advice about stuff. And yeah, I think that's definitely one thing. Um, not listening to any of the advice, like not even getting upset about it, because uh, I it would bother me a lot. Where you know some some friends are very stubborn about their point of view, and then they constantly argue try to argue with you on what you think is right and what they think they know how to do better. And so there's definitely that kind of frustration um, when you try to beat that kind of arrogance out. But yeah, I think that's definitely another thing. That's caused me some emotional stress, I'd say. Um, I'm trying to think, what else is different? What else would I do differently? I try to I try to start it earlier. <laughs> like, uh, as much as my friends and my professional professional brand has always been about discipline i definitely do think that there's an element to me that likes to procrastinate on big projects like the podcast project it, i procrastinated on it for a while like i had the idea for it in march i was talking to people about it and it, i didn't actually launch it until august 
I recorded all the episodes by June, I think. So I think, yeah, I could have easily done it in two months instead of five months or six months, so how, many, how long it, it took me. But yeah, I think I could have definitely launched it faster. And it's it's more so I'm saying it so that I can get off my ass and start my next few ones that I've already kind of pre-recorded some episodes for. And I'm just kind of sitting on my ass about that. So that's also something. Um, yeah, I'm trying to trying to get better at it. But I don't know, maybe it's part of my creative process. Maybe I, I like to sit on things for a long time. And that's how I know whether something's good or not. That's what I've been telling myself anyways. And next question. What have you learned from doing the podcast? A lot of things. A lot of things. Um, yeah, ignoring a lot of advice. That's something I think very valuable that you don't learn until you receive a ton of advice. Um, and I honestly think, yeah, like I, I, I think I've really actually learned more about asking better questions. Um, learning to dig deeper into conversations. I think that's also been one where I try to not have much of a script, but also really trying to stay focused, concentrated, and dig deeper into what the person is saying to pull out more of the story. I think I'm getting better at it. Um, some of my more hardcore listeners have been saying, oh yeah, I, we can even tell the difference. You've seen, you've got, you've improved as a questioner. I'm like, oh yes, that's awesome. So uh, I think that's definitely stuff I've learned, like the true art of conversation. Um, that also includes aspects like getting your guests to calm down. Like I've had guests who got nervous and that's also really cool when I can try to get them to calm down and try to create this environment where they feel comfortable by asking them certain questions where they become more comfortable from doing this. So that's also been a really cool learning. And and obviously all the ton of stuff that I've learned from talking to all these cool people. I think that's the biggest thing. The big, the overarching theme of that is perspective. I think the vast expanse of perspective I got from talking to all these people just made me appreciate um, the difficulty of the journey I've gone on more and it's also helped me become much more patient, I think. Um, because the re- one I tell, I also openly talk about this on podcast episodes where I tell, I say, yeah, like this is a very therapeutic experience for me because I feel mm, like it's a really tough journey and you feel it's definitely lonely. And it helps to know that people have gone through it, they are going through it, and that you're all doing it together. And so that's a big thing that the podcast has taught me by having these kinds of conversations. And obviously another big thing is the fact that people are super kind because I'm taking up a big chunk of their time. They're taking, I don't want to say a risk, but they are because they're public, publicly putting out their stuff that they believe in. And for them to say yes to that, it's super kind. It's super kind for people to do that. Um, so that's also something that's been awesome. And there's all the technical stuff like learning how to edit audio and learning how to host a podcast and all that stuff being part of this new economy that's all been really cool too and yeah i'd I'd say those are like the big things um but by far i think the coolest thing has the cool the coolest two things have definitely been just the cool conversations i got to have from meeting all these fascinating people and just improving as a questioner as an interviewer that's actually been really cool and really fun and really rewarding personally to develop more of that skill final two questions um do you make any money on the podcast have you tried i do not make any money in the podcast except through donations but the donations i just believe cover everything my essays my newsletter my podcasts um so that that's honestly like it's awesome that it's, I have people that donate and it's, yeah, it's honestly been super cool to have people actually donate from listening to my interviews, reading, reading what I write. And it's, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get so like cheesy or anything, but it's so cool because it's like, it's nothing like having what I did, like a job where people are, it's kind of like you're buying, they're peop- the people are buying what you make. And actually, they're not even really buying it. Like they give, they're donating stuff to you. So it's just 
shows the kind of appreciation people have and that's really cool um yeah so not, other than that nope no money like you know you don't see any advertisements on the podcast um and it's yeah I haven't, I haven't gone out to find advertisers i have ideas of potential um organizations i could potentially have on but at the same time it's just not something i'm gonna stress over about and yeah that's mainly it like i i did consider i did try uh well i tried in terms of trying to really grow the audience size because i wanted to if i approached organizations i wanted to come with a bigger set of you know download numbers and all that but that was a three-month period of extreme misery where like i told myself it was a 10 a 10-year journey and i was trying to speed things up i was trying to you know once again listen to advice of people and be like oh yeah i gotta make money off of this and i gotta do some quick growth and you know hit hit these like churn growth numbers and in, in this next month and all that and hustle 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 and it was so miserable it was so boring i hated it i hated myself for try- going down that lane and yeah it's just not how i wanted to earn trust and it's just not what i believe in and i'm not saying that's right i'm not saying i know what's up and it's just a different style like i i personally don't i'm not a big fan of companies that do this kind of hyper growth strategy thing and relentlessly just try to buy people and yeah it, i i believe in doing things really slowly the turtle over the hair and yeah it's i don't think either way is right or wrong it's just this is the approach that's more comfortable for me and i think i've chosen so yeah i i'd, I'd love to make money at the podcast that'd be awesome then i think it would definitely take a lot of mental stress off of me if i can get like advertising dollars but you know that's an avenue i think that's going to be open if i can continue doing this for the next decade so there's no rush really last question oh i don't like the fact that i'm ending off of this question maybe i should have thought about that but it, the question is why don't you do video i don't do video because i actually experimented with doing a vlog for about a month and a half or so it was a weekly vlog that was separate so i learned actually how to do video edits and all that so that was pretty cool but it was kind of boring I, I just got bored about it i got really annoyed doing it and i stopped getting motivated about it so i just stopped and having done the video stuff yeah it, it it it's different i i ended up paying attention a little more become a little more conscious about things and i'm i'm not really a person that really gets bothered by being on camera i i I generally enjoy being on camera but i could definitely tell that oh yeah like i i was thinking in the back of my mind like oh how would i look if i did this i'm looking at the screen and i want to make sure my eyes are looking at the camera properly and all that and if it's distracting to me i can only imagine how much it'll distract my guest and i felt that it would probably definitely deter the kind of conversation that we could have um if the guest is actually not very familiar with being on camera i think some of my guests have been on camera before like actual video interviews because i got asked by like the secretary or something oh like is this going to be a video interview i told them no and i think that actually helps with the scheduling as well because people aren't as um you know scared about it like they're not to dress nicely and prep more more and like make sure the office that you know their office is clean and all that so I think it's actually helped not having a video interview at least in terms of getting the guests on the podcast and that's the more important thing really because if I don't have the guests then I don't have a product. So I think yeah that's something another consideration of why not to, to do video and I spoke to a couple of podcasters who do video or did as well. And yeah it's just another thing that I don't want to really add to the process. It's just going to make it annoying because it's not like i particularly care about video i mean i listen to podcasts i don't watch the podcasts and i really could care less how people look when they talk so yeah that's it's also a personal preference really there because i don't care for it so i don't really expect other people to care for it and yeah maybe you know maybe if you know with the if i do achieve my dream and i have this whole media platform and it's like a whole uh media holding company and i'm making millions yeah for sure video is definitely an option then <laughs> but until then uh the early years i don't i have no plans of any making it um video and audio just audio for now and yeah i i like audio i feel like people are more 
not accepting, not keen. So, you know, I'm exposing my limited vocabulary to you. But they just become more comfortable, I'd say, just with getting a little deeper, being more vulnerable with their story. Yeah. If it wasn't video, I think it'd be harder, for sure. And so that's it. Wow, I can't believe I spoke for nearly an hour. This is hard. I don't know how some people do solo podcasts. This is hard. Like, my throat really hurts from doing that. Also indicates... I'm surprised I can talk for so long with friends sometimes. But, um, yeah. I hope this was informative if you were very curious about what it's like to run a podcast. And, yeah, it... You know, if... If you have questions, um, now not related to the podcast, but more towards, I'd say, um, what what do you call it, uh, careers and just designing systems in your life in general, feel free to reach out. All right? Okay. All right. Well, thanks for listening and have a good one. Take care now. All right, thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope the story was inspiring to you. It, hopefully, it also helped you expand your perspectives. Hopefully, it also made you question the default path that you might have been going on or the default beliefs you might have had. And maybe now it'll make you even think about doing something about it, doing something different maybe, challenging yourself, being courageous. Who knows? But regardless, I'm really happy that you took some time out of your day to listen to this fantastic story with my guest. And if you would like to somehow, in some way, contribute and help support the podcast and maybe even just be part of the community that I'm trying to build with the greater OMD Ventures platform, really think about being a stakeholder in the platform. And the quick way to do that is to go to my website, oldmandan.com and go to the stakeholders page. I believe it's oldmandan.com slash stakeholder. And the link is also down below. And that's how you can figure out how you can subscribe, follow to get more updates on the free content. But at the same time, also donate. And donate by actually just buying me a coffee. That's just how I put it. And you can buy me a coffee a month, coffee a week, or coffee every day of the year. And think about it as the way that you know, if you wanted to chat with me, you might just bring me out for coffee and buy me a coffee. Or if you wanted to bring one of my guests out to chat, you might buy them a coffee. So I'm just think of it as I'm the service that's doing that for you. So you can just pay me in coffees. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, everything will still be free. It's just It would just really help if you would like to show your support this way so that I can use the coffee money to buy myself actual coffees and also to buy my guests actual coffees at and use the leftover money to actually grow the platform as well as even keep it operationally alive as well because it all this isn't really free and it does take a lot of time to build it as well as operate it and hopefully grow it further so your support would be amazing if you would like to contribute and so yeah just check out the website go to the stakeholders page and read the different kind of benefits you might even get as a stakeholder. All right, thank you.